Hi everybody and welcome back to Faith Bernard Insights. Today we have we have a wonderful guest speaker who's going to introduce herself. So hi Sally, could you give yourself, could you introduce yourself to the listeners, tell them how your week has been so far and what you're currently up to at the moment? Thank you very much Faith. Um, hi everyone and thank you uh, Faith for inviting me to, to speak with you today. No uh, my name is Sally and I am a senior lecturer in business management at Leicester Castle Business School. Um, I teach and research contemporary business issues from within the context of social enterprises. And I think I'll talk more about uh, what that means as we proceed with this conversation. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Sally, for that um, for that very wide overview. Just to give the, just to give us just to give myself and the listeners really a good overview and insight into what you're doing. And I, I love to I love to use the word insight because it's Faith Bernard's insight. So I'm providing the listeners, and today we will provide um, the, we will provide the listeners with that insight into who you are, what you're doing, and how you how you can help them in terms of to inspire them to continue on their career path and journey. So let's get started. I've got loads of questions from Sally today that I can't wait to get. Stuck into. So the first question is, can you tell us a bit more about your research on organizational resilience during exogenous shocks in the social enterprise context? And I'll move on to the second part of the question after that. Okay, brilliant. Um, that is an interesting question because, as you know, uh, the Bank of England has increased uh, interest rates. I know it's ever so slightly, but it does have an impact on people in terms of, uh, you know, their income and what they can do with that. Uh, so what my colleagues and I are doing um, is that we're researching how social enterprises are responding to the crisis. We are looking at well, what are the sort of strategies that these organizations develop when yeah. we have exogenous shock? And exogenous shock in this case is about the economic crisis, the cost of living crisis in particular. And it, it's still an ongoing research and we still want more social enterprises to contact us, uh, to be interviewed. But so far, what we are finding is quite interesting. Yeah. Um, what we have found so far is that social enterprises in the UK in particular um, are reactive in their response to the cost of living crisis. So they're thinking about new ways of generating income just as the crisis occurred. So they didn't have a plan beforehand about you know, what they're going to do should, yeah. they, should there be a, an economic crisis. But that's understandable because if you think about when this happened, it was around September 2021 yeah um as we were also exiting uh, covid to some extent so they were just coping with how they felt about covid and then here comes the economic crisis as well exactly, yeah. so there's been a lot going on for these organizations well thank you sally for that once again you've really kind of delved into what happened there in terms of in terms of the exogenous shock as well of the cost living crisis which has undoubtedly had and continues to have a ravaging impact in society today you know interest rates increasing is really really um, is really problematic because I was talking to my dad about it the other day and he was saying that the more people spend, the, you know, it kind of has a knock on effect on the interest rates because then the interest rates are then increased because the government will say, well, people clearly aren't struggling. And so we can, you know, shard more in terms of taxes and other things like that as well. And so hearing what you're saying there, giving us that overview, giving us that insight into what you're doing and what you continue to do is very, very interesting. So thanks for that. So my second question, which really stems off what you've just said, um, I think you were kind of actually, actually answered it already because you have the questions beforehand which was what are some key findings or insights that you have gained from this research which you did actually talk about when you mentioned about kind of that you know that knock-on effect between the cost of living crisis how we were kind of leaving the pandemic already and it's like basically a sudden shift uh, it's, it's a lot for people to deal with not only were we kind of trying to readjust to that new normal and um, post-covid post-pandemic but we're also now having to deal with the aftermath and the continued impact of the cost of living crisis so thank you sally for that so um question two then so as a un volunteer i know obviously you can't delve into or disclose too much about the organizations that you work with but could you just kind of tell us how you came to be a UN volunteer and just kind of what's the experience of that uh, so far and to date? Um, yes, thank you. Um, being a UN volunteer is a really good opportunity to basically share your skills and also learn from other organizations. I joined the UN volunteer program about two and a half years ago and my 
task really is to support social organizations and charities, but I do this virtually. So right. I joined the online version of the volunteer program. So it's just like any other job, what you will see um, on the UN volunteer program website, there are lots of opportunities. First, you have to register yeah. <laughs> and then you have to approve um, that you are where you say you are, you have to send lots of documentation. And after that, um, there are opportunities for you to get involved in a range of different projects. Um, yeah. So some of the projects that I've supported have to do with um, helping women. Uh, some of the organizations have helped in terms of developing a website um, and also creating certain content for them to achieve, to help them to achieve their sustainable development goal on gender equality. Mm -hmm. um, so there are opportunities out there. And for me, I think this is a perfect example um, of how I engage in scholarly activities because yeah. what I want to do is to make sure that what I'm doing in terms of my research can also be um, sort of transferred in a way in one form or another in real life organization setting. Yeah. Thank you, Sally, once again, for giving us that overview. And, you know, for me, it sounds very interesting as someone who isn't, you know, I'm not a volunteer for the United Nations, but, you know, for it's, it sounds very, very interesting for someone who might actually want to become a UN volunteer in the future. And so, you know, as you kind of really delve deeply into the application process, into the eligibility criteria, and really into what the role actually offers and what it entails. And I, well, I love the aspect where you're talking about empowering women to build websites, to, you know, to be more entrepreneurial. I think that's very important because, there is a gap in the market as a black woman myself who has a business who is entrepreneurial and I do come from an entrepreneurial background with my family everyone in my family has a business and so I really want everybody else in the world and that's why I do this podcast as well it's to inspire the next generation that if I can do it you can do it too because there's no difference between you and I and so when you're talking about being a United Nations volunteer it really does embody some of the same principles and ethos that I actually hold close to my heart as well so that's very interesting once again to hear you talk about that and so this really segues into the next kind of set of questions really so could you explain the con the concept of entrepreneurial entrepreneurial bricolage and how it influences innovative solutions to specific contextual challenges and I'll put a joke out here everybody before actually I had to make sure I did pronounce uh, the word bricolage correctly so <laughs> that's what you have to do your research so uh, over to you Sally Thank you. Um, yes, it is entrepreneur bricolage. Uh, what I've learned over the years is that um, there are people in resource constraint environments. So people who don't have much, many resources. It could yeah. be, you know, physical assets, infrastructures, etc. And this individual somehow are able to develop, um, you know, a, solutions to their problems using the resources that they have available yeah. so the concept of bricolage really is about how people in resource constrained environment the, the idea stemmed from that um how people in resource constrained environments are able to use their available resources yeah. um, to create solutions or to be able to meet their own very needs that's what yeah. bricolage is about so i'm interested in looking at well how, what, what resources do you use first and foremost so because when we talk about um, using your available resources, I think it's important to also understand, well, what are those available resources? Yeah. Right? Because available resources will differ in different contexts. So um, at the moment, my colleague and I, um, it, he also works on, a, on organization resilience research. We've done a different research looking at contextual issues within social enterprises in Africa. Yeah. And it was a systematic literature review. So we looked at papers that have been published in academic um, journals from 1990 till 2022. And what we did with this research is to try and make sense of, well, what are those issues that exist within the papers that have been identified from the context of Africa? And then we identified a bricolage Right. Um, so some of the different types of, we conceptualized bricolage uh, from, from those papers. Um, so what are the resources available and what are those uh, solutions that they create as a result of those resources? And, you know, one thing I would say is that a prominent resource uh, from this particular context and the research that we did is networks. Yeah. So the, the networks of people is actually a, a, an example of bricolage. So I met you, Faith, at the uh, Birmingham Black Business Show. Yeah. Uh, Right. And yeah. so that's an example of a, network. of a network. That's an example of, you know, what you can use to help you achieve your goal as an entrepreneur, meeting people and exchanging ideas, exchanging yeah. contacts. You know, we met there and here we are. So that's really interesting. A good example of that. Yeah. Yeah. Again, the concepts, the concepts 
of bricolage is very very um, enthralling it's very interesting and the reason is as you mentioned one of the key aspects of the bricolage of bricolage is is that networking and I always talk to my listeners about networking and networks and how you should like use those networks in order to take yourselves to the next level but also to kind of tap into a new world out there and what I was really interested in when you were talking and setting the scene about that research as a politics graduate you know we had to always read a wide range of research papers on different political topics and so one thing we will always have to do, we have to read it straight away and understand all, we have to understand all of the variables they use. We have to understand the aim of the paper. We have to understand all, all of all of the entrepreneurial a- aspects in terms of the, of the bricolage and networks, because if someone was writing a paper about the pandemic, we had to understand bricolage in terms of the networks. We have to we have to understand different aspects. And so what I really find interesting is although we're, we're operating in different sectors, bricolage does still come into play in those very different sectors because as you mentioned, and I'll inform the listeners again, we met at the Birmingham Black Business Expo. And so that was a bricolage, so through bricolage, that was a networking session. And so what I'd also say for anybody who's really wanting to scale up, anybody who's wanting to step out of their comfort zone, head on to LinkedIn, head out to these kinds of events. There's a range of events happening across the UK at the moment that are entrepreneurial. If you just type in entrepreneurial events or business shows, this will give you a good opportunity if you have a business. And even if you don't have a business, but you want to learn more about other businesses, this is the opportunity for you to, again, use bricolage use those networks and get out there. So you've already actually um, tapped into the examples of bricolage and case study. So I'm going to move on to the next question. So your recent projects have focused on small organizations in the Northwest Himalayas and their sustainability oriented strategies. What What motivated you to study this particular region and what are some interesting findings from your research? Well, this is this is an interesting question because um, um, I, I was actually invited to be part of this project. Um, if someone I know, a friend of mine, said, "Well, I I know someone that you know um, is interested in exploring the Himalayas uh, sustainability. I know that's your area. Yeah. Um, would you you know like to be part of the research again? Networks, right? Um, yeah. And you know, through a conversation, we met, and I said." Yes, I think this is this is a fantastic project. The Northwest Himalayas is, uh, in a way, a remote context if you think about it. And you know, I would very much like to explore this. And so that was the motivation for me: the subject and the fact that you know someone who knows me was able to pair me up with another person. Yeah. Um, and in terms of the research, I mean, we recently published this um, in the International Journal of Entrepreneur Behavior and Practice, uh, Entrepreneur Behavior and Research, rather. Um, I'm very proud of that work because uh, what we're able to do is we focused on sustainability oriented strategies. So when we think about sustainability, we we think about environmental issues, really. Yeah. Mm. We also think to some extent about economic issues, but we also f- try to focus on social issues, poverty, homelessness, and so forth. Um, but really environmental issues is taking far more um, you know, gender when it comes to sustainability. So what we try to do here for our research is to try to understand how these organizations in a remote context are responding yeah. to sustainability issues. Because majority of the issues affecting them um, and the, the ones that we uh, had interviewed and researched um, through longitudinal interview, data collection and observation uh, in their natural environment is that they face many ecological issues. Yes. Yes. What I think is quite unique that stand out from our research, we have a number of findings, but one of the factors that really stand out from our research is that these organizations have a reactive response, just yeah. like social enterprises do with the cost of living crisis, quite interesting. Yeah. But the other thing is that the, um, the ecological issues they face has to do with the fact that they're remote. Yeah. They also face infrastructural challenges. That's unsurprising because, you know, because of where they're situated. But the issues that they face and the, their remoteness, paradoxically, is also an opportunity. Yeah. Right. If you think about it, so people, um, w- where they are situated becomes an issue for them. Yeah. They can't access many of the modern facilities, equipment, etc. They have to transport this into a remote space. But we also found that this remote space is a tourist attraction at the great same time. Yeah, for great opportunities. Yeah. Great opportunity for them. So there's yeah. this paradoxical tension between a challenge and opportunity. I and like that phrase. That. I like yeah. that phrase, the paradoxical tension. I like yeah. that phrase. I think that's a very, very nuanced phrase. Very, very interesting phrase. Um, 
paradox paradoxical tension i'll keep that phrase in my mind when i'm actually talking when i'm when, when i'm doing an exposition of a certain physical text yes the paradoxical tension of x y and z of being different variables sally yeah that's very really interesting and, um, again uh, my kind of my um my uh my understanding of politics and my former study of politics uh, which has recently come to an end has again allowed me to tap into that kind of the ecological context around the world and looking at the differing infrastructures and so what's also important is to look at the social the economic the political factors and wider than those factors as well as you've mentioned when we think about sustainability um our initial thought is to think about okay what are we going to think about it's sustainability it's the environment etc cetera, etc cetera. but there are also the ecological impacts that these countries who are remote actually face as well i think what you actually mentioned so although they are remote they didn't let it be their limitation so they actually found a gap in the market to allow them to, uh, to harness it and make it into a greater opportunity. And so that is a key method. So don't let your obstacles be a stumbling block. Let it be something that you overcome. And that's why I really want to, to, to tell all of the listeners here tuning in today that if you have any obstacles, any struggles, just overcome them. Now, it's not as easy as it sounds because there will be other challenges. But if you just have that in your mindset that you're not going to be defeated by this obstacle, as we heard from Sally just then in that example, talking about those, those who are remote, it will get you to the next level. And so your recent, pro yeah, so social impact assessment then is a crucial aspect of social enterprise. What are some methods or frameworks that you have found effective in assessing the social impact of social enterprises? And so are there any challenges or limitations in this area that you have encountered so far? Oh, well, there are lots of challenges, <laughs> but there are also opportunities. I'll <laughs> always say there are opportunities. Um, you know, there's this saying that the, the glasses are full, that yes. sort of mindset. But I'm thinking, well, maybe you have enough drink. Maybe you need to get the right glass. So <laughs> that's, that's, how I, that's how I see it. Um, in terms of social impact, I mean, it's crucial for organizations to be able to demonstrate the impact that they create. So if, an, is a, if a funder is going to give you capital, financial yeah. capital, to um, you know, undergo a project to for you to be able to conduct your project, whether it's to tackle homelessness, or um, whether it is for you to uh, do something around gender equality and so forth within a community, they expect you to be able to tell them at the end of a project or even media the media of that uh, funding cycle that this is what you have achieved. Yeah. What um, I was able to do, I've published this work with um, one of my co-authors, um, and this is published actually in the Social Enterprise Journal. It's mm -hmm. accessible online. We published this in 2020. What we found was that um, social enterprises um, are not necessarily unwilling to measure their impact, but they, they don't know what tools or frameworks yeah. to you to, to be use able to, to measure the impact. Yeah. So in our research, what we did was we're able to identify um, you know, over 80 um, tools and frameworks yeah. to measure impact. So the tools are out there. Even the New Economic Foundation has got a list of tools on their website. Yeah. Um, so what we did was that we looked at the tools and then we said, well, if we have these tools, but well, what does that mean for social enterprises? It really doesn't mean much. What we did was that we looked at each of these tools. We did a content analysis yeah. and we tried to capture what each tool is there to serve. Yeah. So the local multiplier three, for instance, is there to assess um, a community level um, mm -hmm. impact. So it yeah. looks at the generate income generation in relation to a community um, level project. We also know that the social return on investment is another type of tool that captures both qualitative and quantitative data. Data, yeah. So what we were able to do is to say, these are what these tools are here to achieve. But the, the icing on the cake was that we were able to also identify the tools that are appropriate for a small, medium, or large enterprise. Because a small organization would have a different approach to measuring a large organization. Yeah. Right? They would also have a completely different mission. Some organizations focus on the environmental mission. Yeah. Some organizations focus on, um, you know, um, com ecological missions or economic issues. So... That's what we were able to do with our paper. Um, and the title of the paper is Evaluation of Social Impact Measurement to a Systematic Review of the Literature. Um, and I'm happy to share the link with you later. I believe Please it's open do, access yeah. so anyone can, can access it. 
Well, you beat me to it, you know, Sally. I was actually <laughs> going to ask you, can you send all of your research through? And so, everyone, when I do actually publish this episode, I will put all of Sally's uh, research and publications in the bio so you can click on it. And I'm glad it's open access as well, so it's accessible. Um, but, yeah, I, I love what you're saying about that. You know, there are key differences between a large organisation and a small organisation as well. Some of them will focus on the carbon footprint. Some of them will focus on their social impact. Some of them will focus on their economic impact. And so when you're actually reverting back to what you're talking about with gender equality, I actually took a I, I took a module on a, it was on women and politics and so what it was actually talking about is you know really delved into women in politics but it was broader than that it was looking at a range of countries a range of kind of systems it's not they weren't all democracies some of them were weren't democracies and so it was about understanding and analyzing the key differences as you said before and it really actually um just to make a comparison. So what you said about the comparison between small and large organizations is the same thing we saw between non-democratic and democratic countries in terms of women in leadership, women in politics. And so what we actually found, I was reading a paper on where it analyzed the, you know, the number of women in politics and in senior positions in the European countries compared to countries, to other countries who worked in Europe. So we looked at African countries, we looked at European countries, we looked at Asian countries, so we looked around the world to assess whether what was the gap, what was the difference what was the barrier um and i found it quite interesting as well because we did see that more conservative countries were less welcoming to women in politics whether it be an african country or a european country there was no difference in that but then there, there were also differences between other aspects of countries more broadly and so when you're talking about that as well it's really important for the listeners and everyone here to understand that each thing in life, each um, each organization, each country will have a different strategy. And going back to what Sally you were saying about the tools as well, you know, qualitative and quantitative data is something that is very well known. But there are wider tools than that to actually be able to use. There's cross sectional, there's cross sectional analysis and other tools that people can tap into in order to analyze something, and that's really important. So you have yeah, presented, and, you, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and just to to add to that, um, there are organizations that look at both social um and you know economic issues yeah. it's not simply one issue over another some would look at both some would look at the social and economic because there is an interrelation between those factors so people that are unemployed are they also facing homelessness for example yeah if that makes sense so yeah it does. there are tools that can allow organizations to assess both um, types of uh, social objectives yeah, 100% completely, because there is something about the socioeconomic um, analysis that can happen, having a look at people who are socio socioeconomically really disadvantaged because of where they've grown up in terms of their economic status. And as Sally was saying, just the back then as well, that can happen. So some organisations will focus on more than one. It won't just be one, but it can be two, both of those that really have an impact and really have a knock on effect on each other as well because someone could even have a look at the political social economic impact and and so on and so forth there's so many things we could go in today but the times that permit us but there are a range of variables that one could use to uh, really form a good analysis on a particular subject so you have presented your research at both national and international conferences could you share some highlights or memorable experiences from these conferences and then how has your how has engaging with the academic community and practitioners influenced your work Gosh, well, that's that's a big question. <laughs> um, we'll break it again, down in parts. <laughs> um, th this is the power of networks and also not just networks, the power of communication within those networks and the power of using those opportunities that you find. Because when you attend conferences, I mean, I, as, you, as you know, I've attended both national and international conferences. Some of my um, highlight conference uh, or favorite conferences, I would say the British Academy of Management. Yeah. Um, that was my very first academic conference, um, which I attended in 2015. Mm -hmm. It was actually in Portsmouth. I remember it uh, very clearly. And then I've had the uh, Institute for Small uh, Business and Entrepreneurship. Um, I, I'll be attending that again this year. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, the International Social Innovation Research Conference that's been in Glasgow. It's been in Australia. It's been in Canada as of last year. Uh, it's been in Italy as well. Um, I attended the um, one in Italy. Um, you know, fantastic conference, absolutely, you know, brilliant to meet with social innovate, uh, innovators and uh, social entrepreneurs, both academics and, and practitioners, and some are pracademics, they are yeah. practitioners and academics, <laughs> academics as well, yeah. so I think that's quite, that's quite interesting, um, and, you know, I, I go to these conferences with intent, with intention of meeting like-minded individuals and hopefully come out of there with a plan to do further research. Um, I recall 
when I attended my very first um, conference uh, in Portsmouth. That's where I met my now co-author, one of my co-authors, wow, that we great. have worked on two projects together. Yeah. Uh, and we, we recently also published um, a book article with, um, with Sage uh, this year, January of this okay. year. Um, you know, so you know, I, I go to these conferences with a plan and, and you know, not to say I, I see someone and I go, this is what I have to do. But what you have to remember is uh, for these conferences, you get a program. Yeah. Of what of who's presenting what. Yeah, the key speakers. Basically. Yeah. So, yeah. so I, I, I would look at the program and, and I would look at some of the uh, tracks and also um, highlight some of the topics, titles that really stand out. And I do a bit of research about who these individuals are. Is there alignment? Could we possibly work together? So that's basically what I what I do before going to these conferences. And it's been fantastic. And I've also attended the Corporate uh, Responsibility Research Conference. Uh, but I actually attended this virtually. I would have um, gone in person. It was in Israel. Um, this was by Open University two yeah. years ago, if I remember correctly. And, you know, so there are lots of different research avenues and opportunities out there. It's just... Um, trying to find the right one to attend because you can't attend them all <laughs> you can't no because time is limited but you know what you were talking about that kind of that is a top tip Sally actually that's a top tip in terms of looking at the brochure to see who's going to be presenting you know that actually puts you above the rest because not only are you actually aware of what's going to be happening on a particular day you're also aware of the topics that they're going to be dissecting later on in that day and so when you're actually networking with someone you can say hi so and so tell you know can you give me your opinion on x y and z and so that will put you above somebody else who doesn't actually know their you know their field or their specialism but that's really good and when you're talking about you know the uh the importance of really being able to streamline and to actually choose which kind of conferences you actually attend i actually attended a conference in sydney i wasn't actually physically in sydney but it was virtually i was in sydney so i attended a, um, a conference uh it was a law conference because i'm an aspiring barrister a very very interesting law workshop um you know hosted by the university of sydney and that really gave me a differing perspective to for example uh, for example from a a UK university because the law was different they're very they're, the, the way of kind of uh, composing themselves was different so there's a lot of things there that's different and um I I love that you're actually that you, that you actually had a paper uh, published in Sage because I'm and where I'm very familiar with Sage as a politics student we always have to read Sage articles and articles that are published in Sage so once again Sally do send those links for it and I will endeavor to ensure that hopefully everyone has access to those links is the Sage publication open access as well, or is it through universities? It's not open access, I'm afraid. Yes. You, okay. I mean, if you have a university affiliation... I do, um, yeah, yeah. Yes, you should be able to access it, yes. Yeah, because I'm going to access mine through King's College London. But if you're at university, you can access it through your university affiliation. If not, unfortunately, you won't have access. But for the other ones that Sally has published, you will be able yeah. to... Um, really get stuck into those ones um okay so we're near to the end actually we've got a few more questions uh before we wrap up today so being a member of the british academy and uh, so let's okay so being a member of the british academy of management and the european council for small business and entrepreneurship what are some current trends or emerging topics in the field of social enterprise and entrepreneurship that you find particularly interesting or important Okay, this is quite this is quite an interesting one because I think that um, there are lots of different topics that are emerging in di across different tracks. Yeah. Um, but some of the ones that I think are prominent and would have a long-standing um, place in in research has to do with artificial intelligence and the integration um, around social innovation. Yeah. Uh, I, that, I think that's really a, an important one. And also uh, things around creative social innovation. So we know that social innovation is a, an important advancement of innovation um, that looks at how we maximize and uh, make use of current resources and the tools that we have and to be able to address some of the social issues that exist. Yeah. But you, we need to look at creative ways to be able to do this. Um, so there's this conversation around that. There's also contextual interests around the global south versus the global north. Yeah. And much of the research that we see, we know comes from Europe, United States, but there's major interest now looking at places like Africa and Asia. And fast forward, these conferences have specific tracks yeah. um, on this, on this, uh, in, in this context. So I think that's also an interest to look at that, looking at innovation from, um, from different perspectives. Um, I would also say there are mission climate change. Uh, before that's also a prominent issue because there's a rise, this continuous rise um, in climate catastrophe, in disasters. 
Um, but there are also other things, especially in entrepreneurship, around migrant entrepreneurship and refugee entrepreneurship. And that's also gaining traction. Um, I would also say uh, things around displacement um, as well. There's research Definitely. around displaced people, the entrepreneur yeah. within displaced groups. So these are some of the themes that I would say are uh, sort of emerging. I'm sure there are uh, others that I would like to, you know, to, <laughs> to explore. But those are the key ones um, that I think would have a long-standing uh, place. And there's also rural entrepreneurship and uh, entrepreneurial um, education as well. Um, there's also entrepreneur academics <laughs> because of, of the current challenges that we face. People have to really rethink their work, Definitely. rethink how they do things and how they position them, uh, themselves in spaces. So entrepreneur universities, entrepreneur cities. Um, yeah. Th well, there's yeah. quite a lot of themes there. Well, Sally, you're really speaking my language, as I said, as a postgraduate, graduate, because one of my modules uh, last semester was actually on climate change. One of my modules last year, when I was in my second year, was on immigration. So we talked about displacement and displaced people. Um, we talked about a lot of things as well. And actually, I actually wrote a paper um, in my third year. It was on AI. It was actually identifying a recent policy proposal or regulation on, on AI. Um, and it was actually evaluating the kind of um, the plausibility of this policy of this kind of regulation of both ethical and economic grounds. And so I understand what you're talking about. And you're really, as I said, speaking my language because those are what I, that's what I'm interested in. And really, we'll have to catch up again, really, to talk a bit more about this in depth. Um, but that's really good. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm aware we have a little bit of time left. So I'm just going to quickly go over these last two questions. Um, as a founder of the Social Enterprise Research Group, what are the goals and objectives of the group and how does it contribute to advancing knowledge and understanding in the field of social enterprise? So this um, group was set up in 2021 uh, by myself. Um, we have five members in the group. Uh, it's, a, it's a small research group, I would say. And we do like to keep it that way. I don't think really it's about quantity, it's about the quality of what we try to achieve in the group. Yeah. The so focus of the social enterprise research group is to conduct contemporary uh, research on issues that affect social enterprises. So what are yeah. those contemporary issues that are affecting organizations today, focusing on social enterprises in particular, the cost of living crisis is an example of that. That's where this, you know, re this research sits uh, within this group. Uh, we also know things around embedment of sustainability issues will come into play. We also know that there are conversations about the role of the social entrepreneur. So the strategic leadership of the, of the social entrepreneur, uh, what are the personal values? You know, they're more altruistic as they say, compared to other organizations. So our sole focus within this group is to conduct those contemporary issues and how we advance knowledge is by providing comprehensive insights into those issues and how they extend current knowledge um, that we know of. What we, we also want to do this from a developing and developed economies perspective yeah. so that we are able to provide a more holistic view about how social enterprises are defined and operate across the world. That's, that's very interesting as well, because I think it's very good to have a diversified um, opinion, diversified reflection of the different kind of opinions. Uh, I think looking at the the um, countries, because there are some countries you said that are developed, some are still developing. And so you don't want to admit any of those countries, but then you, that we still have to acknowledge that there will be different impacts for developing countries because they're still trying to get to the certain point that developed countries have already met. And so they'll be able to, obviously developed countries will be able to maybe withstand more challenges, economic challenges or social challenges or political challenges than developing countries because they're still developing that infrastructure and that framework by which to abide by. So that's really interesting that, that you actually made that distinction. And finally, then, could and you, yeah, go ahead. If, if I may just, I also want to say that um, as part of our research, although it wasn't our intention, but what I think we would also do, um, coincidentally, I would say, by doing this research or range of research that we do, especially from a developing economy's point of view, is to try to distort stereotypes um, or distort poor narrative or poor research in a way. So yeah. for example, I remember attending a conference, I'm not going to say which one. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> someone that presented at the conference said that social enterprises are new to Africa. Well, actually that inspired me to engage in the research and when I contacted my, <laughs> my co-author, uh, when we did our, fir our first paper uh, and what, what on, on this particular content within this group, not my first ever research paper, but 
uh, what we found is that social enterprises are not new in Africa. They've actually been around since the colonial era in yeah. the 1800s. Exactly. In, and the first emergence of that was, was in Tanzania as a cooperative. So, yeah. you know, so we hope that by what we do, change we're able narrative. to say, yes, we're able to change the narrative and pro- use evidence to, to be able to distort that. Yeah, I think that you know evidence is needed to have a paradigm shift because a lot of people will have concerning narratives and discourses concerning Africa to say, oh, Africa's not developed, Africa's poor, and all stuff like that. That's very, very negative. And so actually, through you know, through actually undertaking a politics degree, I was able to understand that there's actually wider things out there that looking at colonialism and then neo-colonialism as well. There's actually things that have happened to Africa that have basically prevented us some to the growth. It wasn't just like Africa decided not to grow, but there are certain things, there are certain countries that prevent the growth of Africa, which is really interesting for me because actually my um, I, I recently did a dissertation and my topic was why France should actually pay Haiti back for the uh, 1825 ordinance debt. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it's where France basically extorted Haiti of 15 million francs, which is basically 21 to 115 billion dollars today. And so in that paper, I was really, really delving into why they should be repaying Haiti back because it stunted their growth, had an adverse impact on Haiti. And so that's why that's one of my passions, actually, to really change the narrative um, concerning countries that aren't as developed because something must have happened in that chronology, in that history to prevent such development. And finally, then, could you recommend, I'm re- I know we only have two minutes left, that's the one of the perks of a free Zoom plan, but could you recommend any resources or readings for individuals who are interested in learning more about social enterprise, sustainability, stra- sustainability strategies, or entrepreneurial bricolage? Um, yes, there are a range of textbooks uh, that one can read. You can also read some of my articles, especially on social impact. Uh, this is a good one. This is a good textbook. Um, social entrepreneurs, can they change the world? Um, there are other ones, social entrepreneurship. Um, how can social entrepreneurs change the world? That, that one is particularly interesting by David Boynston. Um, so, you know, Susan David, so you, you, you can read into that. Um, there, are, there is The Savage Mind by, um, you know, Levi Strauss, um, 1962, if you're interested yeah. in going all the way back, uh, you, can, you can read that. Social entrepreneurship theory and practice is also another good text. Uh, what you can do is who you are. That's another text that you can find. Um, there is also so- social entrepreneurship with international cases. Um, I think I would always recommend international cases. It doesn't mean, I mean, you, everyone is international, just depend on where you are. So it includes <laughs> uh, cases um, of social enterprises across the world, uh, you know, yeah. Europe and, and everywhere else. I think it's really brilliant because then you are able to situate how social enterprises actually work. I don't think you can necessarily learn social enterprise by sitting in the four walls of a classroom, although I, I've taught social enterprise before and it's great, but I also take students on a journey, take them yeah. out to real world social enterprise to see how they, how they operate. Um, there's also creating good work that I would recommend as well. So yeah, there's a range of um, texts that you can read. And um, if you're interested, there's also uh, Muhammad Yunus, Building Social Business. Um, he created the Grameen Bank, yeah. uh, Microfinance. Yes. Very interesting. Well, I'm weary we have less than a minute. So I'm thinking, do I just send you out another link or do I <laughs> attempt to try and finish this? <laughs> so we'll get, I guess I'll see how far it goes. And if it ends, I'll just send you out another link. But very interesting, Sally. Again, thank you for those recommendations. Um, that'd be really great. So I'm assuming these books can be either purchased or are they accessible online, these books? They're accessible online. You can get them through your university library. Um, so if you're feeling... <clears throat> okay, so, okay, Sally, still connecting to audio. Okay, Sally, welcome back. Hi, Sally. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> the um, So for, for context, everyone, one of the perks of having a free Zoom plan is when you, you only get 40 minutes. So because we're actually so engaged in this conversation, we've run over that 40 <laughs> minutes. And so I've had to send out uh, a second Zoom link to Sally. So Sally, where were we? Yeah, so these books are available online, you said, right? Yes, they are available online. You can get them from you know your university's uh, library or you can if you want to purchase them by amazon feel free but if you are part of a university i would just say go online and check them i'm sure they have a ebook um copy as well as you know physical copy fabulous thank you sally so thank you sally carr for coming on to the faith renowned insights podcast where we really delve into a range of topics from um well range of topics there's so many to mention right now i'm just gonna yeah, so for those who, uh, thank you everybody for tuning in today, for listening. We talked about organizational resilience. We talked about entrepreneurial 
bricolage. We talked about um, we talked about sustainably oriented strategies. Um, I learned a bit more about the concepts of bricolage as well today. So thank you, Sally. That was like a lecture for me as well. And I'm sure, like for those listeners who weren't aware of bricolage and some of the nuances and aspects of bricolage in terms of networks. They were able to learn about that today. And so, as I said, Faith Mail Insights, the podcast, is this educational platform by which people can learn. Even myself, I can learn from guest speakers. They can learn from me. It's like kind of two-way street where we're learning from each other. And so that's what I really enjoy about Faith Mail Insights. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sally Carr, for tuning in, for giving up your time today to speak to me this afternoon about your journey, about what you're doing as a UN volunteer, as a social enterprise, as a founder of the Social Enterprise Research Group, as, as a member of the British Academy. Academy of Management. There's so many things that Sally's currently doing. It's literally, there's not enough time in the in the outro. <laughs> there's not enough time in the outro to summarize it all, but I'm sure you all get the gist. And um, any questions, feel free to reach out to Sally Carr. So it's Sally S A W L Y and then K K A H um, on LinkedIn. Feel free to connect. She's on Twitter as well. Um, Sally, if you could just send me your Twitter details, I will put it in the bio. So if anybody has any questions, which I'm doubting they probably will have a lot of questions. Uh, they can actually direct them directly to you as well. So, Sally, thank you very much. Anything thank like you to so, Thank you so much, Faith. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I, and I think for me, it's also a reflexive moment, um, yeah. thinking about my journey and what I have been doing uh, and, you know, what I will continue to do research-wise. So it's been a great pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone listening. No problem, Sally. Thank you very much. Have a great day. And you too. I'll- and so without further ado, everybody, this is my this is your host, Faith Brunel. And today I'm here with Sally Carr and we're signing off. Thank you, everybody. Bye.